highly, very important privacy. We take it as our number one role and advocacy. We also we always make sure we advocate. So all that theory was based basically on the experience that Dr. Malinga had. That was how she came about this culture. <coughs> And we're talking about um, the theory being unique in caring. Most hospitals right now are also following in this um, unique care um, to patients. Like I can take an example from where I work right now. They have a large population of um, Jewish population. So they make it a possible, they put like kosher diet on the meals for Jewish um, patients. They also um, had like uh, Shabbat compliant bathrooms. So in which, you know, during the Sabbath, um, the um, Sabbath period, they are not allowed to use the switch. They are not allowed to operate any equipment. So once they step into the bathroom, everything comes on. They use the, um, the, um, the air washer, it comes on. That's what they mean by Sabbath compliance. Because when, they, when, I think it's Sabbath, or I don't even know which one it is, I'm sorry to say, but I know there's a particular time during the Jewish where they are not supposed to operate anything electronic. So. And also the theory, the purpose of the theory is basically two things, cultural and culturally considering care, which is factoring that care of a patient is based on their values that I explained earlier, their values, their beliefs, their life ways, we incorporate everything together into the care. We take into consideration all that when we are caring for our patient. And also cultural competence that is building, um, providing nurses that also in, um, make sure that family members and community are also involved in the care of the patient. Okay, um, and the major premise of the development of the culture care theory was that they can be, um, they can be no curing without caring but they can be caring without curing. Um, like even in medicine and nursing, you know, you can't uh, expect that every time you have an interaction with a healthcare provider, you're going to fix everything. Like for instance, with our hospice patients, we know that they're terminal um, and that they may end up dying. But just because there's nothing we can do for them medically doesn't mean we don't care for them, um, even though we're not going to cure for them. So we make them comfortable. Uh, we make those last moments really, um, uh, memorable to them, and that's one aspect of caring. Um, now, you can't really cure without caring because um, even in interacting with people that um, are ill, sometimes you can actually regress them by not showing empathy, um, any care to them. Um, you can imagine an interaction where you you're talking to your doctor and he is just telling you this is what you need to do to take to fix your problem, go home, get prescriptions, but if you don't understand, you don't feel like you have a relationship and you're not compliant, you get home, you're not going to take those medications, so you're not going to be cured just because of the lack of caring. Um, and one of the tenets of the culture care theory is that they are, um, even amongst all the cultures, they are universe, uh, universalities and they're also diversities. So amongst all, all the people in the world, Everybody understands, um, you know, I, I think it's what we call the universal language uh, of caring. In a lot of places, smiling means it's warm, it's welcoming. Um, you have diversity, things that are different, um, but we do need to be aware of those things that are similar amongst all the cultures and also the differences in order to give care that is culturally competent and also congruent. And the other tenet is also that we, they are social structures that influence the meanings of care amongst cultures. So, um, like for instance, uh, the family setup for in, in other cultures, you know, you may have where um, fathers provide care, or strictly mothers provide care, or women don't care for men that are not their husbands. There are social structures like that that we need to be. Uh, considered all. And then also um, the last tenet is that emic, emic and etic care, uh, they influence health and illness. Now emic care uh, is generic care practices. These are practices that people practice at home. And uh, etic care is professional care, um, evidence-based care. 
So the difference really would be, for instance, if you use um, apple therapies from that have been passed down generations that, you know, if you crush a guava root when you have a cold and drink it, it'll take care of the cold. That's a generic care practice. And then, you know, the professional care is if you have flu, we will give you tummy flu because it kind of helps slow the progression of that illness. Now, um, this is uh, Lainey, Dr. Leininger's Sunrise Enabler. Um, that also is one of the tools that are used to expand nursing knowledge in assessing cultural and social structural dimensions in caring. Um, as you can see, it looks like the rays of the sun going outside, it encompasses all the elements that influence the meanings of care to, um, to people. So um, if you look at where you have educational factors, um, how educated are you? Um, does the difference in being uneducated, what is the definition of uneducated, or having a professional education, does that impact how you view care and meaning? Does it make you more likely to go to a hospital versus trying things at home? Um, of course, economic factors, finances, what you can afford, is it cheaper to go to the hospital, is it cheaper to stay at home or buy over-the-counter medications? Uh, political and legal factors, um, also the impact of, you know, we have Obamacare going on around, a lot of that is determining whether or not people get health insurance. And then uh, also your cultural values, your beliefs and your life ways, um, that also takes a, into account um, how you perceive your health meaning, depending on how you were raised or what you've inherited or, you know, what your culture practices kinship and social factors, um, that is how do you interact with your family, who cares for you and your family when you're ill, um, how do you perceive how they care for you, and then uh, with the religious and philosophical factors, that is what impact does your religion have on how you practice um, health and what are the meanings of health. And then of course your technological factors. Everybody Googles now when they're sick, so sometimes they get good information, sometimes not. But also, uh, how competent are you with using technology to explore health meanings? So all those elements do influence the care expressions, um, and uh, they do affect how you get holistic care in practices of illness and dying. And you see, you can see how it encompasses uh, generic care um, that we talked about earlier, the nursing care uh, practices and then professional care cure practices. And this leads down to um, what we call transcultural care decisions and actions in terms of healthcare. Uh, and then we have the three modes at the bottom <coughs> that are the main focus of, um, of healthcare, which is cultural pre uh, preservation and maintenance culture care, accommodation and negotiation, and then culture care, repatterning and restructuring. And we'll talk about those here in a little bit. And here, um, we just have a question. Why do we do cultural assessment? I'm just going to throw that question to you. Why do you guys think you do cultural assessment? For all the reasons you've just been <laughs> explaining, it's so important for, it's so important for the patients to, to get better. Right. They need we need their culture to be um, considered. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely right on that. We do cultural assessment because we want our patients to to um, um, confide in us. Sometimes, you know, when you say, for example, in the nursing in the hospital, initially you, you are, the patients are usually guided because they don't want to, they don't know you, and they think that you're invading their privacy. But if you find a way to ask them questions about their culture, about their lives, make them feel comfortable, have them relax, then they feel like they matter. So it's very important for us to do cultural assessment because we also bring the relationship between us and the patients when we care for them. So we do our own self-assessment for us to know who we are within ourselves, our biases, our stereotypes, what we like, what we don't. Then we go further. If we have a, you know, different cultures, we can learn about those cultures by reading about them, having knowledge about those cultures, so that when we have anybody that we are caring for, we already have an insight, but we are not using it as a generalized to generalize all because in between the main culture, there's also subcultures. 
So we cannot assume, like you said earlier, that all Arabs are Muslim. Because we know things about Muslims, then we cannot generalize. Anytime we have an Arab patient, we are already assuming they are Muslim. So we have to have that open knowledge to know about every different culture as much as possible because there's a lot of them. So we need to educate ourselves on a daily basis, do research, and read more about different cultures. And after that, then we can assess other people, assess our patient, know where we have our differences, our similarities. We'll be surprised how people from different parts of the continent have similarities in culture that they can relate to amongst each other. And here are the steps to cultural assessment like we talked about earlier, the self-assessment, and we already talked about this, talked about our own biases and cultural beliefs. So. I'd like to just point out that from this picture, you know, he thinks he's looking good, he's gonna sail through the self-assessment, and that's how he sees himself. Um, and in reality, that is <laughs> what he looks like. So you just need to be aware of where you stand in your, you know, in the perspective of things. Now holding knowledge, again, like Yemi said, that's knowledge that you acquire, that you take time to research. So um, that is by going to conferences, learning about different cultural aspects, um, or watching DVDs, YouTube videos, and just reading. That's how you attain holding knowledge. Now, um, uh, assessment of others. There are um, a lot of tools out there. Um, this is can be like an assessment of just individuals or organizations or hospitals. Um, it's just taking that extra steps to learn more about. And remember, culture is not just about you know who you are, what you believe. Like for instance, organizational culture is how people in a workplace uh, actually function. What is their culture? Is it you know? Um, can, so you, you have that kind of, um, those kind of cultures that you can also assess, and you can also assess health cultures as well. Um, you build a knowledge base by using other uh, tools that are available out there just to gain that knowledge of um, all the different cultures that you can experience. These are some of the uh, tools that uh, are used amongst healthcare professionals, and the inventory for assessing the process of cultural competence among healthcare professionals. Um, this is a tool that was developed by Dr. Kapina Bakote, um, and it also it explores five main areas of cultural competence, and there are subtypes within that. But um, some of the cons constructs included uh, cultural self-awareness, and then um, your cultural knowledge, like what do you know about the different cultures. And then cultural skills, um, th those are some of, uh, and I know as nurses too, we've experienced like just using cultural skills um, in assessing culture. And then also you have to have like um, a desire, cultural desire, you have to have that yearning to learn about other cultures, so you, you know, you're more open-minded during that process. And then uh, finally, you do have to have an encounter with somebody of that culture that you're trying to assess in order to learn about it. Um, it kind of puts it in perspective. And then um, Dr. Leimingas, a stranger to trusted friend and abler, um, this is one of the tools that she actually uh, developed while she was in New Guinea um, doing that assessment on the Getsa tribe. Um, it is when a researcher actually immerses herself in the culture that she's trying to assess. So you start off as a stranger because people don't know you, they don't trust you, they don't open up to you. But as you progress from stranger to trusted friend, you open up, you know, you learn their ways and their life ways, you learn some of their language, they start to trust you, you become included in their culture and they open up and they share information with you and that way, as a researcher, you learn more. And then we also have the transcultural self-efficacy tool, which is really a self-assessment of your of your own culture. And just to talk more about the um, stranger to trusted friend and neighbor, it's, and it's just basically little things that you never really expect that will make them warm up to you. Mm -hmm. Like I just want to give an example of Dr. Leilinger's experience while she was in New Guinea. 
she I'm just she didn't know that um, because she curled her hair, she put her hair in my collars and